Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well, and I'm so very glad you've joined me this evening for a fabulous story. So before we get started, you know the rules. Go and get yourself something lovely and refreshing to drink, and let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Dr. Dennis Plowman was furious. He'd never felt so incensed in his entire life. His blood was boiling, his breathing raspy and constricted. It would seem taunting images of his beautiful wife Anne flash before his eyes, like a video being played out in his head. He pictured how distressed she would become when he had his little chat with her this evening, which brought over uncomfortable waves of guilt that he could not relinquish. He had let her down badly. He was financially responsible for his beloved wife and their four-year-old boy Mathis, as well as the baby on its way, the soon-to-be new bundle of joy to add to the family. What would be the consequences of this devastating news? What would it do to Anne? He dreaded to think. A bitter nausea washed over the back of his throat. He felt certain he'd be violently sick, and there was no anti-nausea medication on the entire planet that could shift this repungent taste, or the vacuous thorny hollow that had clawed its way up into his gut. What would he tell Anne? And more to the point, how was he going to tell her? This was his greatest concern. The revelation was not going to go down well with her, that was for sure. It was not the kind of news that anyone would gladly welcome, even at the very best of times. It certainly wasn't good for pregnant women to have any stress during pregnancy, and now he was piling her plate magnanimously, with the meat and potatoes of worry and uncertainty. Anne was already suffering greatly from swollen feet. The baby was causing her lower back to ache, with the extra pregnancy weight she was carrying mainly in her front, which he had been informed by someone in the know meant his wife was probably expecting a boy. He couldn't believe it had come to this. Who knew a day could be like a piece of paper, so cruelly torn to shreds in no time at all, and thrown away in the waste paper basket, as if it had not meant anything at all? He was allowed to be mad. He wouldn't be human if he wasn't. The day had been unassuming, like any other, in its straightforward predictable rhythms at the dental surgery. Dennis had two patients before 12 p.m. Things had run as smoothly as a stream meandering over its rocky course, nothing to suggest that like a glass of milk in the sun, it would soon turn rancidly sour. Dennis had been cordially invited to lunch with his business partner, Dr. Adrian Coots, who worked with him at the surgery. The lunch engagements were common between the two friends, as Dennis considered Adrian Coots to be one of his best friends. Not for a moment had he envisaged what an unpalatable lunch this would ultimately turn out to be. Soon he would leave the restaurant with poison in his gut that did not come from some listeria in the food. This kind of poisoning was brought on by distasteful words. These words were like bullets that had the power to be loaded into a rifle and with one pull of the trigger could cruelly blow your life apart. Dr. Adrian Coots, whom had initially asked him to come into business with him as another dentist for his private practice, was about to let him down in ways he had never envisaged possible, and more to the point, at the worst timing imaginable. The two men had studied dentistry together and known each other for many years. Dr. Coots had taken out a large loan with the bank to set up a private dental practice of his own in the town of Portland. The cost of all the accessories dental chairs, x-ray machines, computers, medical supplies, and all that paraphernalia had cost an arm and a leg. They'd been running the business for seven years now. Things had looked promising in the very beginning, but with a huge dental clinic that had started up adjacent to them two years ago, it had rudely emerged like a thorny perennial weed thrusting itself through a flowery meadow, obnoxious, ugly, and unwelcome. Their adversary was offering cheaper prices than they did, as a result, over the last few months, the success of Adrian Kutz's dental surgery had plummeted. Many of their current clientele had strayed, opting to go for the cheaper costs offered by their competitors. How do you compete with big business? It's impossible. People these days had become very cost-conscious. They weren't looking for a dentist they had a good rapport with, who cared about them personally as a patient. 
That was a plus, of course, but most were looking for a skilled dentist who could do the root canal for the most cost-effective price. It wasn't surprising that dentists had some of the highest suicide rates in America. It was a cutthroat industry. It would seem their overheads were so expensive, and with the hefty monthly instalments, Dr. Adrian Coots was still paying back to the bank with a cumulative interest. Things had not smelt rosy for the practice. By all accounts, things were rapidly going downhill, like a falling pack of cards fast. They simply couldn't afford to slim down their dental prices for their customers, much as they would have liked to, without compromising on the quality of their dental materials. Adrian Kutz rightly refused to use inferior products on people's teeth. The big dental practice over the road seemed to have the upper hand. Adrian Kutz had been forced to make some adjustments to cut down his expenditures. He'd been forced to let go of one of the receptionists, along with the dental hygienist, a woman called Philippa McGrange who had a hissy fit when Adrian had given her her marching orders. Letting go of people was not a pretty business. From now on, both dentists would do the dental cleaning on their clients. Dennis never imagined that when Adrian Coots was making cutbacks in his surgery, that he would be the next unfortunate victim on the receiving end of that hit list. Soon he would know exactly how Philippa McGrange had felt when Adrian Coots had told her that her services were no longer required. The Friday lunch had begun so nicely. The atmosphere of the modest, unembellished Italian restaurant, Al Dente, had been swingingly convivial, with the fragrant smell of oregano, tomato sauce, garlic and melted mozzarella wafting around the restaurant, causing stomachs to rumble in eager anticipation of the culinary banquet yet to grace their tables. No one ever left Al Dente's disappointed, but it would be very different today. One man would leave the tables with his tail between his legs, feeling as if his whole life had been cruelly shattered into smithereens. At al dente's there was always a bubble of chatter, the trillful high notes of sing-song laughter, the tinkle of knives and forks, the drum-like clatter of china, and the light ethereal pinging of glasses that formed a tuneful orchestra of background sounds, the sounds of contented people thoroughly enjoying their food. Al Dente's was a private little enterprise that had boomed exponentially, with a sweet elderly Italian couple from Tuscany running the helm of their business, like two very skilled ship's captains. It would seem that 79-year-old Francesca de Lucia was a culinary queen, creating very authentic Italian cuisine that was to die for. People flocked to Al Dente's to enjoy their traditional Italian fare. They served fabulously rich full-bodied red house wine and the tables were always simply decked out with red and white check tablecloths. The cheerful vibe in the restaurant was contagious, and always popular on a Friday afternoon, when the day offered the promise of a blissful, lackadaisical weekend ahead. Dennis noticed that Adrian looked very fidgety, as if he wanted to say something, but was struggling to find the words. Dennis had never seen his friend look so out of sorts. The waitress who served them recognised Dennis at once, and gave him a big warm smile. She was a willowy young woman with long legs like a giraffe, and equally as bedazzling eyelashes that framed her brown eyes that were so obviously false. You're Dennis Plowman, aren't you? Dr. Dennis Plowman, she giggled. I thought I recognised you. I don't know if you remember me, do you? I'm Claudette Glendowine. I got in touch with your surgery a year ago, begging for you to see me. I was in excruciating pain. I don't know if you remember... It turned out you had to give me a root canal, along with a course of antibiotics. I hasten to say you saved my life, Dr. Plowman, and for that I'm eternally grateful. The other dental practice over the road from you, the one in that big nondescript beige building, well, they wouldn't see me. Can you believe it? They said I had to book six months in advance for an appointment. She said, rolling her eyes in abject disgust. I told them I was in pain, that it was an emergency. But they didn't seem to give a damn. They couldn't have cared less. But Mr. Plowman, you saved the day for me. You told me to come in at once. Let me tell you, that tooth pain was like nothing else I have ever experienced in my entire life. They say toothache is worse than giving birth. But you rescued me from the pain of a hellish experience that I'll never forget. Well, I'm glad we could be of help, said Dennis, smiling ruefully knowing that they were probably able to help as their books were not exactly congested with bookings unlike their competitors 
and he'd always made cancellations if urgent cases arose. He considered Claudette's words. You're right, there's nothing worse than a pain from an infected tooth. I have seen grown men cry like babies with toothache. The pain can be insufferable. I know women who have told me that giving birth to their own children was easier than coping with the pain from an infected abscess. Claudette's eyes squinted in the prism of afternoon sunlight that streamed audaciously through the window of the restaurant. She rested her hands on her hips. I ask you, Dr. Plowman, how did they survive back in the 1800s when they had an infected tooth? God only knows. Well, many of them died, didn't they? said Dennis Plowman. Unless, of course, they pulled the tooth out. But even then, you could so easily pull the wrong tooth out. That was a big problem. As you can't actually always identify where the pain is coming from. Or, in truth, which tooth is actually causing the problem. It requires a great deal of testing to decide which tooth is the offender. People can get it horribly wrong. Dentistry has luckily come a long way since then. I guess in the 1800s. They played guesswork with people's teeth, pulling out sometimes several dozen, until the patient was fully satisfied that the pain had finally gone. Well, I'm glad I didn't live back then. I'd have been taken out a long time ago, Dr. Plowman. My teeth have always given me problems. I don't even drink soda. I do everything right. But I'm always getting holes in my teeth, like some people get ladders in their stockings. Now let me take your orders, gentlemen. I would like to recommend the Noki today. It's excellent, she said, smacking her lips in a dramatic gesture of appreciation. It's light and airy. And of course it goes without saying that you won't find any other Italian restaurant that makes pizzas quite like al dente's do, this side of Portland. And that is a promise. Pizza it is, then, said Dennis, smiling. I'll have a margarita with pastrami. And you, sir? What would you like? asked Claudette, who was looking directly at Dr. Adrian Coots, who appeared to be staring out of the window blankly, as if his mind was otherwise engaged. Dennis could see he was glancing at the large dental surgery, a little further down the road, strategically positioned opposite the Adrian Coots dental practice. Adrian's jaw stiffened, his eyes narrowed like a spiteful cat that had murder on his mind. It was clear he despised the dental practice who had stolen so many of his clients away without even batting an eyelid, and they had no shame to boot. Sorry, sir, repeated the waitress looking at Adrian. What would you like? Adrian shrugged his shoulders. Sorry, I was miles away for a moment. The knocky sounds just perfect. Excellent choice, said Claudette, retrieving their menus and scribbling down Adrian's order on her notepad. When she returned to their table, she presented both men with steaming dishes of delectable food, and giggling she nudged Dennis and said, I asked the cook to give you extra pastrami on your pizza. You were so good to me over my infected tooth. I don't forget anyone who rescues me from pain in a hurry. You'll always be my hero, Dr. Plowman. Thank you, said Dennis, smiling warmly at Claudette. Enjoy your food, she said, scurrying off. Adrian lifted up the mouth-watering pizza slice into his mouth, and the melted oregano and cheese and pastrami titillated his taste buds. It was absolutely delicious, and quite simply the best pizza he'd ever tasted. Adrian Kutz's face was ashen, and trembling he took a sip of his red wine, putting it down on the table, and looking directly at Dennis. Little did Dennis know that in any second now his life would begin to fall apart like a ladder in a pair of tights that rips through the sheer fabric. You know that I've been having to make cutbacks, said Adrian gingerly. I'm afraid, Dennis, I'm going to have to let you go. Dennis began to laugh. You're joking, right? he said, biting into his pizza. You're having me on. This is a joke. The two dentists often wound each other up. Adrian's expression was sober. There was no glint of humour in his grass-coloured green eyes. I'm not joking, Dennis. I'm being deadly serious, I'm afraid. I'm asking you to go. I can't afford to keep you on in the practice any longer. You know I've been forced to make some uncomfortable cutbacks recently. And simply put, I can't afford to keep you on. It's as simple as that. You are kidding me. After all I've done for you. 
What exactly have you done for me? asked Adrian, raising a dark caterpillar brow. With the greatest of respect, most of our clientele, whose teeth you've been treating, are actually mine. You haven't brought much business to the practice yourself on your own merits. I asked you to come into my business, Dennis, as I thought the business would prosper, and you're an excellent dentist. It was great having you on board, and I've enjoyed working with you. We've made a very good team together. But the truth is I can't ignore the elephant in the room any longer. And with the cutthroat competitive competition out there, I just cannot afford to keep you on. There is only enough business to keep myself busy. It's not personal. I'll give you great references, of course, but I'm sorry it has come to this. I hope that won't sour our friendship. I've done a lot for you, Adrian, and this is how you treat me, said Dennis obsequiously. If it wasn't for me, you'd never have met your wife ten years ago. Don't forget that. Nor would you have your two children. I was the one that invited you to Liza McPherson's party, if you remember. When you wanted me to introduce you to your wife, I went out of my way to do so, as she was my sister's friend. I set the two of you up together on a date, and gave your wife a push to go out with you. She wasn't even interested in you in the beginning. She said you weren't her type, but I begged her to go on that date with you for a special favour. Put it this way, without my invaluable contribution, you might never have met her. I'm very grateful for that, Dennis. Rarely I am. I keep telling you it's not personal. I'm not laying you off now as I speak. I'm giving you advance notice. You've got until the end of the month to make other arrangements. Plenty of time. Any dentistry out there would be lucky to have you. I'm sure you will be snapped up in no time at all. Dennis pushed his pizza away from him, as if it had suddenly turned into a bowl of grey sludge that he couldn't possibly digest. It slid across the tablecloth towards Dr. Coots. His food no longer seemed remotely palatable, as a bitter bile coated his throat. His chest was constricting so tightly that he could barely breathe, while his trembling hands had become moist and clammy. "'I'm suddenly not terribly hungry. Some friend you are, Adrian.' Talk about kicking a dog when he's down. In case you've forgotten, my wife has a bun in the oven. She's due to give birth very shortly. And I've got a four-year-old boy to take care of. I need this job. It's not easy out there. It's a minefield, and you know it is, especially in our industry. Look, as I keep saying, Dennis, this is not personal. I have to let you go. I wish it didn't have to be like this, I rarely do, but it is what it is. If our business had been prosperous, everything would be different, you know it would. But that dental practice over the road from us, with their insanely cheap, very questionable prices, has drowned us. Sometimes you have to cut your losses. I can't afford you. So I'm surplus to requirements, am I? Oh, please don't feed me all this baloney, Adrian. Dennis got up from the table, pushing the chair away from him so loudly that it scratched the parquet floor fiercely. He raised himself up onto his feet, and with an indignant dramatic swagger, stormed out of the restaurant, with Claudette running behind him. "'Is everything all right, Dr. Plowman? I see you've left your pizza. Did you not like it? Was there too much pastrami on it? I can fix it if you like. It's no trouble at all. Really, it isn't.' There was nothing wrong with the pizza, Claudette. It was absolutely delicious. It was the company I was keeping that was badly tainted. He dipped into his wallet and brought out a five-dollar note, which he handed to Claudette. Thank you for the great service. If you want to know what's going on, that man over there sitting with me at the table, my so-called business partner, has just fired me from our dental practice. I'm livid. I've worked for him for seven years now. I'm a damn good dentist, and he's just dumped me, thrown me out with the dirty bathwater. He brought me out to lunch to tell me I'm surplus to requirements, redundant to the practice. He doesn't need me any more. I have a wife with a baby on the way, and he does this to me. Claudette gasped with astonishment, her hands cupping her mouth. The bloody cheek! How dare he dump you like that! You're a damn good dentist! Don't mind me, she said. I'm going to give that nasty piece of work a piece of my mind. Men like him make me sick. 
Think they can treat their staff like dishwater and get away with it? Dennis watched Claudette marching defiantly over to Adrian Kutz and could see her giving him the riot act. To his surprise, she snatched the glass of red wine he'd been drinking from him and flung it into his face. The man looked completely bewildered as the red wine dribbled down his face and turned his white shirt a pink colour. His green eyes were popping out of their sockets. He was flushing with embarrassment as every eye in the restaurant was fixed on him. What did you do that for? he growled under his breath. Everyone is staring at me. He hurriedly mopped his face with a paper napkin. Dennis chuckled. Serves the loser right, he thought. Good for Claudette. It was good that someone was fighting his corner for him. She was waving her arms around like a frenzied octopus and pointing her fingers accusingly at Adrian Kutz, which attracted the attention of all the diners. Claudette had Italian ancestry, that was clear. Not only in her long, dark hair and honeyed complexion could you see it, but her fiery personality as well. Her frenzied fury was bubbling over like an inferno and amusing the customers who clearly thought she was a spurned lover who was extracting her revenge on a cheating lowlife and some of the customers were cheering her, saying, You go, girl. Good for you. Hope he gets what's coming to him. Claudette barked at Adrian. Mr. Plowman saved my life when I had an excruciating toothache, and you're getting rid of him? Firing him, are you? That's insane. Just so you know, I shall not be supporting your dental practice any longer. You've let go of such a fine dentist whose wife is pregnant at the moment. You should be ashamed of yourself. Who does that with any heart? That man saved my life and you're dumping him. What on earth is wrong with you? You don't understand, said Adrian. I didn't have a choice in the matter. That's bull and you know it. Everybody has a choice. Claudette turned around to the customers who were watching the scene unfolding before them. She piped, You see this loser over here? He's only been seeing three other women behind my back which created the reaction she'd hoped for, as people gasped, shook their heads, and cast Adrian some disdainful looks. Some clapped and cheered. You're well rid of him, love, came a gentleman's voice. You need that man like a hole in the head. As Dennis sank into the comfortable leather seats of his GMC Sierra, he felt as if his life had been swallowed up, like the plankton in a whale's mouth. For a brief moment he sat in his truck, staring absent-mindedly into space. His eyes focused on the dental practice on the opposite side of the road from the private surgery, where he'd worked with Dr. Adrian Kutz. He could see a plethora of clients going inside that practice, like hornets returning to their nest. He suddenly felt such hatred and loathing for the opposing practice, as if he'd like to douse the whole place in flames and seeing it burn to the ground so that all that was left of the ugly building was a pile of grey ashes. It was large businesses like this, owned by big corporate shareholders that were driving small businesses like Adrian Kutz's into the ground. These big medical enterprises could afford to offer their clients lower prices so that smaller businesses were unfairly crushed and often forced to shut down their doors. Adrian glanced up at the lugubrious sky that had become ashen, just like he felt, and in the distance the thunder groaned and grumbled, as if this bad day was infectious, almost as if the sombre, very grim mood was highly contagious. There was definitely something in the water today, he thought. He saw two very disgruntled young women standing outside in his sand truck, on the street where he was parked, screaming the odds at each other. He'd seen them in the Italian restaurant only moments before. You stole my money, Hilda. I know you did. I went into the ladies' room for just a moment, and while I was away you dipped into my purse. I mean, how low can you get? said the woman, lashing out at her friend furiously. You're nothing short of a common thief. And you have a rich husband. You don't even need money. But you took it just for the hell of it. It's all a big game for you, isn't it, Hilda? A little bit of fun for your personal entertainment in your boringly dull, privileged life. Hilda growled in retaliation like a cornered dog. I never took your money. You probably didn't have the money in the first place and you're making it up. Don't put words in my mouth, Hilda. You stole a hundred dollars from my purse. It was there only moments ago. And I want it back now, or I'm going to call the police. 
In a trice, a violent scuffle broke out, in the parking lot, with two women pulling each other's hair and calling each other unmentionable names that contaminated the air with their foulness, like a bad, obtrusive smell. Soon, a surly-looking parking attendant came waddling along the street, like a disenchanted duck. He had greasy hair and piggy eyes, with three folding layers of skin hanging under his chin, like a turkey's neck. It would seem his extended girth was so large that the buttons looked like they were about to burst off his shirt. Maybe he'd been overdoing it with the pizzas at al dente's. He looked at the two women with an expression of annoyed frustration dappling his perspiring face, which he kept mopping up with his hanky. This was clearly not the first time he'd had to stop an altercation, and it wouldn't be the last. "'Would you kindly refrain, ladies, from making a public spectacle of yourselves?' or I will call the police. She started it, said Hilda, pointing accusingly at the brunette, with her defiant brown eyes, whose mouth was quivering with anger. She's the one that's blaming me for stealing her money. I think it's best if you leave now, said the parking attendant. I'm not interested in what you're fighting about. I don't need you upsetting the peace around here with your futile shenanigans. People are trying to enjoy their food at al dente's, and there are business around here along the street who won't appreciate the drama you're causing. Don't you worry. I'm going, said Hilda abrasively, tossing her manicured mane of blonde bobbed hair and grabbing her keys out of her Chanel bag. She trotted defiantly towards her white Mercedes with a pugnacious swing to her step. Goodness gracious, thought Dennis, watching the scene unfold before his eyes. This Hilda woman drives a white Mercedes and has been accused of stealing a hundred dollars from her friend. I wonder if she did take it. She looks a little sly to me. Was it possible she was so wealthy she got some kind of euphoric kick from stealing from her friend? Like a bored, lonely housewife with nothing better to do to amuse herself. He'd heard about women like that before. Both women got off into their trucks, slamming the pedals of their accelerators down and driving away so treacherously that they grazed the asphalt road in a stretch of long black lines. Dennis knew he needed to get home. The sky was beginning to cry as tears spurted out of the clouds. At first they were reluctant and then suddenly it poured as if the earth itself was shuddering violently from a downpour of tears as if it too was commiserating with what had been a very inauspicious Friday, not just for Dennis, but for so many it would seem. Misery loved company, and today misery was clinging to anything it could attach itself to, like a tenacious vine strangling a rose bush. Soon lightning forked across the sky, punching the gunmetal canopy into a firework display of yellow zigzags. The thunder boomed, and the rain pelted down while the grey roads in Portland gleamed and glistened under the deluge. Dennis made his way to the Forest Park neighbourhood, which is slap-bang in the middle of Portland, and is comprised of over 5,000 acres of forest woodland, bountifully abundant with a plethora of cycling and equestrian trails, and is filled with all kinds of indigenous wild animals, from squirrels to chipmunk, elk and bobcats, along with a vibrant amount of exquisite birds. It was late afternoon, and the grimly overcast sky was sulking, like a crotchety old man. It seemed set to stay, but the rain showers had suddenly abated, like a faucet that is switched off quickly at your kitchen sink. The rubber tyres of Dennis's car lifted up pools of water on the road. It whooshed through the puddles, unfortunately spraying a less than enamoured woman on the sidewalk who gave him a dagger-like stare and raised a rude finger sign at him. Adrian could see there was mud all over her jeans. He felt bad, as he hadn't seen her. Moments later, as he was getting close to home, he saw the little boy, his neighbour's five-year-old kid, Tyler, trotting across the road. Dennis could not stop in time. He slammed his foot on the brake, which screeched in protest. His car skidded forward, across the asphalt, leaving behind ugly black drag marks. Dennis was waiting for that dreadful low thudding sound you get when you run over something. For a moment his heart leapt into his throat. It would seem even though his reaction time was swift, it was just too late. The brakes weren't working fast enough. He was about to kill or seriously injure a five-year-old boy, and there was nothing he could do about it. But the hands of fate skillfully intervened. He was not prepared for what happened next that interrupted this momentous sequence of events.
A huge, ponderous creature plunged into his line of vision, seconds before the inevitable impact. The ambiguous creature he knew at once was a Bigfoot was covered in a cinnamon-coloured long, shaggy coat. He was about eight foot tall, built like a giant. It lunged into the road, scooping up the little boy in his arms and jumping away from the truck in the nick of time, saving Tyler from almost certain death. The lofty, majestic-looking Bigfoot tossed Tyler casually over his shoulders, like a small sack of potatoes. The boy's face was ashen, as if he comprehended how close he'd come to being run over. He was crying. The Bigfoot seemed to be patting his back as if to console him. The Bigfoot glided straight into the woods with little Tyson over his shoulders. For a brief second, the Bigfoot turned around and eyeballed Dennis, looking at him through deep-set, treacle-coloured eyes, as if to say, Look what you've done. You nearly killed the boy. At least Dennis had the decency to blush with shame. He'd not been going that fast, but he knew unequivocally that if the very quick-witted creature had not rescued Tyler in time, he would almost certainly have been pulverised under his tyres. But the boy had come running into the road from nowhere. He had not seen him before it was too late. How could the Bigfoot move so fast? For a moment he sat in his car bemused and stunned, just shaking from the shock of what could have potentially transpired. Dennis's whole body wobbled like a jelly. His heart pounded violently in his chest. That was close, he thought, far too close for comfort. Next time I drive down this road again, I will go lower than the recommended speed limit, he told himself. There are too many kids around here. This can never, ever happen again. I could have killed little Tyler. Then his thoughts wandered over to the Bloombergs. How could he possibly tell them a Bigfoot had abducted their son? They would think he was smoking something, and worse still, he'd have to admit he nearly ran over their child. Everything had happened so fast, it was so surreal, and even Dennis wondered whether it really did happen at all. This had indeed been one of the most outlandish days of his entire life, certainly not a typical Friday afternoon. Dennis knew his wife would know exactly what he should do. He was dreading going home to her with his sobering news, but nearly running over a child put everything into perspective. Now the object of his primary focus and concern was the Bloombergs, who would likely discover that little Tyler was missing, and there was nothing worse for any parent than a missing child. But how could any parent possibly digest the news that a Bigfoot had taken their boy into the woods? Would the parents ever believe him? It was highly doubtful. Would he believe someone popping over to his house, saying they'd seen his son Mathis being abducted by a Bigfoot? Of course he wouldn't believe them. When Dennis parked his car in the garage and made his way to the front door, he glanced nervously at the neighbour's property. His heart sank as he saw Mrs. Bloomberg calling out for her child. Tyler! Tyler! she was calling out. Where the hell are you? You haven't gone looking for that damn cat again, have you? Dennis had seen enough. He was racked with guilt. He hurriedly plundered his keys into the lock and opened the door. He could hear the sound of the television blaring. He dropped his keys on the entrance hall table and ambled over to the living room. His wife Anne was relaxing on the couch with her legs cradled up to her chest and wearing a large maternity smock that covered her ample bump. Their four-year-old boy Mathis was watching cartoons on the television and playing with his toy trucks at the same time across the parquet floor, happily making those brimming sounds that children tend to make. Anne looked up in surprise to see her husband. You're home early, sweetheart. I did think I heard your truck in the driveway and your keys tinkling on the entrance hall table, but I told myself I had to be mistaken. But here you are. It's been quite the day, said Dennis, the kind of day you would pray to God would never ever repeat itself in the history of your life. That bad? Difficult patient, she asked. Something like that said Dennis, not wishing to go into details about being laid off by the likes of Adrian Kutz. That could wait. Right now he had more pressing issues at stake. The only thing he could think about right now was Tyler being rescued and then abducted by a Bigfoot. The parents needed to know what had happened to their son. But how could he tell them something like this? Something's happened, said Dennis. Something bad. What? said Anne, sitting up, clutching her stomach, as if Dennis's ominous words had personally caused her physical pain. "'You're scaring me!' she said, her face growing white. "'What happened? For God's sake, put me out of my misery! I'm dying right here!' "'I nearly ran over the Bloomberg's kid. 
Their five-year-old boy, Tyler. You know the one. He's a cute little boy. He just dashed out and through the road. I couldn't bloody stop in time. You what? gasped Anne, clasping her hands around her mouth. You didn't! My God! Poor Tyler! I would have run him right over if he hadn't been rescued by a big foot. Anne looked at her husband and wagged her fingers at Dennis. If this is your idea of a joke, Dennis, it's not funny. You've just given me a heart attack. Anne, do I look like I'm laughing? You're telling me that you nearly ran over the Bloomberg's boy and a Bigfoot rescued him in the nick of time by a hair's breath. Is that what you're really saying? And I'm expected to believe that. That's exactly what I'm saying. But there is the problem. The Bigfoot abducted him. I cannot say anything, can I, to the Bloomberg's? Imagine me walking over there right now and saying, By the way, I nearly ran over Tyler, and he was rescued by a Bigfoot, and now he's been abducted, taken into the woods by the creature. Sorry, just thought I'd tell you. Anne sat up with a start. I'll go over and see them right now. I'll pop around with some of my homemade shortbread. I'll feel my way around, so to speak. What will you say? I have no idea. I'll play it by ear. I think it would be wise to tell them the truth. Of course, they don't have to believe us. But it's important to tell them what we know. Dennis was relieved his wife would handle the problem for him as the last thing he wanted right now was to deal with two distressed, overwrought parents. The day was already collapsing in on him. His little boy, Mathis, was calling out to him, Daddy! Daddy! Will you come and play tracks with me? I want you to try and crash into me. We can have a police chase. You can be the very, very bad man, and I'll be the sheriff that arrests you. Sounds like fun, said Dennis, getting onto the floor to play with his son. I'd better get going, said Anne, clutching her stomach and staggering to her feet. She felt like a hippo. Her stomach was very extended. Who knew pregnancy would be such hard work? She was sure she was giving birth to an entire NFL football team. Every part of her body ached, especially her lower back. She manoeuvred herself awkwardly into the kitchen and waddled over to the countertop. She gathered some of the shortbread she'd baked for the weekend that was cooling on the wire racks and placed a large selection of it in a Tupperware container for the Bloombergs. The quintessential excuse to pop over to their house for a fleeting visit, she thought. So there she was, trotting up the Bloomberg asphalt driveway. The house seemed remarkably silent. Its soundlessness almost screamed out at Anne, flooding her with a growing sense of wary unease. Usually when she popped around to the Bloomberg house, it sounded like a household inundated with rambunctious, spirited, screaming kids running around noisily, as the Bloombergs had three children, and five-year-old Tyler was the youngest. The composed ranch-style home stood there stoically, under the lingering shadows of the late afternoon or early evening. It was certainly dark enough to assume the latter. The afterglow smell of the rain seemed to impregnate the earth, with its fragrant dewy smells. The sky was a gunmetal grey, exuding a stormy, cantankerous appearance. It released a belligerent, pugnacious grumble that descended audaciously through the clouds, as if another storm was now brewing. It was as if the neighbourhood wobbled in submission under its growing threats, like surrendering to the demands of a draconian headmistress. It seemed as if there was no young lives dwelling under its expansive roof, and the silence of the house was poignant, but Anne's fears would soon be allayed. She found herself rapping at the front door, and then it was flung open by Mrs. Bloomberg, who gave Anne a bright, warm smile. Anne was surprised that anyone was at home. The house had seemed remarkably quiet. This is a surprise, Anne. It's lovely to see you. What are you doing here? I hope you've popped around for a decaffeinated coffee. Anne could hear the kids racing around the place, screaming, shouting and laughing, unleashing the noises that kids tend to make. The house on the outside had seemed remarkably still, so peaceful and tranquil, but in, on the inside the reverse was true. It had become like a chaotically busy train station with kids' screams and laughs bouncing around the place like inebriated frogs. Mrs. Bloomberg looked relaxed and didn't appear unduly overwrought or anxious about anything. Did she not know that Tyler was missing yet? Had she not realised her kid was gone? I just brought you some shortbread. 
I made a whole batch, and with your three children, I thought they might enjoy some cookies. How kind of you, Anne. You're eight months pregnant, and you're making the neighbor's kids shortbread. You're a good lady. You should be worrying about that little one you're carrying, not us. Have you got time for that cuppa? I could do with some adult company, and my husband won't be back for a couple of hours yet, so I'd love to have a nice adult chat. That would be lovely, said Anne, coming hesitantly into the house. Mrs. Bloomberg beckoned for her to sit at the breakfast nook, after she removed some tired copies of the Wall Street Journal from the seat. Anne watched Mrs. Bloomberg bustling around the hob busily with a kettle in her hands and setting out the coffee mugs onto the counter. You know, Anne, I've always wanted to be a mother, she was saying. I find raising children but is a lonely business, though. Sometimes you crave adult company. When I saw you standing outside the front door, I thought all my Christmases had come at once. My first thought was another adult to talk to at last. How perfectly wonderful of you to pop around. The kids have been driving me mad recently. I'm surprised the hair on my head hasn't turned completely grey. The stress they put me through sometimes, you don't want to know. I'm permanently having many heart attacks. I know what you mean, said Anne, tapping her fingers nervously on the breakfast nook. How's Tyler? she asked suddenly, deciding to blow all caution to the wind. I'm here, said a cute little boy entering the kitchen, with a beleaguered look on his little face. In his hands he was carrying a model aircraft. Look, Mummy, look what Douglas did. He broke its wing. He did it on purpose because I wouldn't let him play with my truck. On seeing the little boy, Anne flooded with relief. Was her husband mistaken? Perhaps it was not one of the Bloomberg boys that had been nearly run over in his car. Maybe it was someone else, another neighbourhood kid perhaps, that had been abducted by a Bigfoot. Mrs Bloomberg examined the broken wing. We'll get your father to look at it for you when he comes back home. Now run along, will you? The little boy obediently scuttled away. That kid, she said, raising a brow at Anne and putting down a mug of decaffeinated coffee before her. That kid possibly has given me more heart attacks than any of my other children. I mean, this afternoon, only about 35 minutes ago or so, after that sudden rain shower we had, Tyler vanished from the house. I mean, I try to keep the kids contained, and my eyes on them all the time, but it's never easy. It turned out he'd gone waddling across the street to look for Sylvester, our cat. It's very dangerous for him to cross that road, all on his own. I've warned him over and over again never to do that, without Mummy and Daddy being there. But he never listens. And as for that cat, Sylvester, he's as bad and mischievous as my own son. Sprinting across the road at will to climb one of the oak trees in the woodgrove, which has become like a watchtower to him. He likes to watch the comings and goings on the street from that tree. So I ran out of the house looking for my Tyler, and then I see him, running out towards me from the woodgrove, with a huge smile on his face. I wanted to slap him, I was so angry. He knew he was in trouble, but he didn't seem to care at all. He came back telling me this crazy outlandish story. Mrs. Bloomberg shook her mane of curls. I think he's dreaming up all these fanciful excuses in order to avoid getting into trouble. Why, what did he say? asked Anne curiously, her attention now very alert. Oh, he said Sylvester ran across the road, and he ran after him, and this car came out of nowhere and nearly hit him. He said King Kong rescued him, gave him a ride all over the woodgrove. He said King Kong was very, very nice. He asked the creature for more rides on his big shoulders, but King Kong said he'd better get back home. His mother might be worried about him. Aren't children funny? The things they come out with. Anne sighed with relief. She could return home, comfortable in the full knowledge that Tyler was safely back home, having been returned by the Bigfoot, who clearly had no intention of abducting him. The creature had saved the little child's life but such knowledge the Bloombergs would never be privy to, as sometimes ignorance is bliss. Well, said Dennis, when Anne finally returned home, how did it go with the Bloombergs? He was pleased his wife was wearing a convivial expression on her face, as his chest was so tight, 
He had dreadful visions of the Bloombergs and police searching in earnest for their son. But his wife's mellow, lackadaisical expression told him at once that all was well. Well, only Sally Bloomberg was there. Her husband was still at work. She told me that Tyler nearly got run down by a truck, which must have been you, but was rescued by King Kong, who gave him a shoulder ride in the woods and then told him that he needed to go home. Of course, Sally thinks Tyler's spouting nonsense, but she had no idea Tyler was telling her the truth. Two weeks later, Dennis had put the word out about looking for a dental position in a surgery and decided it wasn't in his interest to share the news with his wife about being laid off by Adrian Coots. He had almost succeeded in mowing down one little boy. He didn't want to be responsible for causing any further damage, especially to his baby, that was so close to being born, by causing his wife any undue stress. Then a wonderful thing happened by magic that he'd never anticipated, as an old friend of his, who ran an established dental practice, was looking to recruit another dentist, as they were so overbooked they couldn't manage the heavy workload. Now Dennis could relax, as the stresses of the previous month were now fully allayed. It was on a Thursday morning that Anne opened the door to a very excited Mrs. Bloomberg. She barged right into the house, her face a flutter with excitement. You won't believe what happened only a moment ago. I was driving my truck out of the driveway with Tyler at my side, and I saw this big silhouette. It looked right at me in the car. It was a Bigfoot, Anne. It was a Bigfoot. I am not kidding you. You will not believe it, Anne. He waved at me. My son was saying, there's my friend King Kong. Can you believe it? It was such a beautiful lofty creature, so majestic, with the kindest dark eyes I've ever seen, and such a human face. I just can't get over the fact it was waving directly at me, as if I was its very best friend. Anne chuckled to herself. It wasn't waving at you, you daft woman, she thought. It was waving at your son. It knows your son. It doesn't know you. Haven't you got it yet? So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.